This lesson is on angles and trig functions of angles. And um, the first thing we're going to do is look at this angle that we have here and talk about the parts of it. Um, when you dealt with angles in like geometry classes, you probably learned to identify the vertex. But now we're going to imagine angles that kind of get bigger or smaller. Um, we're we're going to imagine that we're moving this side. It's called the terminal side. The initial side we're going to imagine staying put. And so acute angles will be you know in this range and then we move it around and you'll get obtuse angles and things like that. So um, the first thing we want to talk about is standard position. Standard position is the one that we're going to think about in relationship to this. The vertex of this angle is always going to be at the origin in its standard form. And the initial side is going to be along the positive x-axis. So you're going to set this up basically in the middle of an x-y um, coordinate plane. And the next thing we want to talk about are the difference between positive and negative angles. And the negative and positive are just a way to describe the direction that the angle um, is traveling in so to speak. Um, again both of these are shown in standard position. The initial side is on the positive x-axis, the vertex is on 0, 0. So we have this little green arrow that tells us which way we're going. So in the positive angles we're going counterclockwise and so if we're going counterclockwise that is a positive angle so moving in this direction. Um, and it's the terminal side that moves again. Negative angles would be in standard position, so vertex at 0, 0, initial side on the positive x-axis, and then if you'll notice the green arrow showing the direction to be going um, down here from that, and so that will be going in a clockwise direction. So again, positive angles counterclockwise, negative angles clockwise. Before we get to this example, um, I just want to remind you about the quadrants. It may have been a while since you have seen them named. Quadrant 1 is your upper right corner. Quadrant 2 um, is your upper left. Quadrant 3 is your lower left. And Quadrant 4 is your lower right. And these do follow like the direction of the positive angle, the counterclockwise um, in the naming. So um, it matches with the positives. So a first kind of example is one that's just asking us to locate angles. So in what quadrants do these angles lie? 120 degrees. So we have to think about having an angle and putting our vertex on the origin and our initial side on the positive x-axis and going 120 degrees in the positive direction. Well, if I start on the x-axis and I go to the y-axis, that's just 90 degrees. If I went all the way over, that would be 180. So I just want to go to about right here, which would be around 120. So it would be past 90, but before 180. And then that you just look, where did you land? I landed in the second quadrant. So this would be quadrant 2 for the answer. Okay, negative 40. Again, I want to have my x and y axis. I'm going to go ahead and draw them for everybody while I have this color. And um, positive uh, x axis for my initial side and vertex at 0, 0. Negative would be going clockwise. So I'm going to come down. Now, if I went all the way to the y axis, that would be negative 90. 40 is not that much. So 40 is just a little ways in. So you end up in the fourth quadrant. We're not necessarily worried about exactly where to put the line um, right now. We're just identifying the quadrant it ends up in. So it doesn't have to be perfect. Now, negative 650. Obviously, if you go around in a circle, you have gone 360 degrees. So 650 is more than that. So we can have angles that go more than one time around in the positive or the negative direction. Since this is negative, we're going to be going in the negative direction. So vertex on the center and initial side on the positive x-axis. If I go, um, and it likes to disappear on me, if I go negative one whole time, that's 360. If I go a little bit more, that would be 360 plus 9, which is 450. And then if I went 90 more, I would be at 540, 
90 more, I would be at 630. And then 650 is just 20 past that. So you wouldn't make it to the next one. It would just be right in here somewhere. And again, my drawing doesn't have to be perfect. I just have to figure out where I end. And this time I end in the first quadrant. So quadrant one. And then finally, 250. Um, it's positive. So I am going to be going in the positive counterclockwise direction. So I know that like half of a circle is 180. So I end up here. If I went to the next line, I would be at 270. So it has to be in between those two. The terminal side does. So I do end up in quadrant three for this angle. Next, we're going to talk about the word coterminal. And co should be a prefix you're familiar with. Terminal, referring to the terminal side of the angle. And so this definition says two or more angles that have the same terminal side. Um, an example of that would be maybe if I had a terminal side right here, that would be possibly 100 degrees. Or if I went in the negative direction, that would be negative to 60 degrees. So those are two angles that share the same terminal side. In other words, they land in the same place. So that's what that word means. Um, when they ask us to find coterminal angles, it's pretty easy. You can just add or subtract 360 to the given angle um, because you're just, um, you can go more than once around the circle or whatever, but um, this is basically fixing the math to make it look easy. Up here I have the concept of what's going on and that probably should be degrees right here. So let's go to an example of that. Um, for our second example here, we want to find a positive and a negative angle coterminal with the given angle. So for 51, um, if you just use the little technique I, I gave you, we're going to add 360, and that's going to put us at 411. If I subtract 360 from 51, that will give us negative 309. And if you um, sketch those like we were doing um, in that original example, then you will realize that they do end up in that same position. Um, so those are just two of the examples. I could add 360 again and get another positive angle. I could subtract another 360 um, and get another negative angle. All right, example B, negative 7 degrees. I'm going to use that same technique. I'm going to add 360 and get 353. That would be a positive coterminal angle with negative 7. If I subtract 360, that would give me negative 367, which would be a negative coterminal angle with negative 7. Now, C, 700 is a little bit of a unique experience um, because it is more than one rotation already. So if I add 360 following the same little pattern, I'm going to get 1060. If I subtract 360, I'm going to get 340. I haven't answered the question. They asked me for a positive and a negative. Both of these answers came out to be positive. And again, that was because this 700 was more than one rotation around the um, vertex. Um, anyway, it was more than one circle. So just subtracting 360 doesn't get us out of the positives. I have to add, um, or not add, excuse me, I have to subtract 360 again. And this time I do it from the 340. So that gives me a negative 20. Negative 20 is still coterminal with 700. So a positive 700, a negative 20, they land at the same place. If you're answering this question, you could answer with either one of these as a positive answer. So the 1060 or the 340 could be your positive angle. Um, the negative 20 could be your negative angle. You could actually subtract 360 again, get another negative angle. Um, you could just continue this process as many times as you need to. So your answer may not answer match the answer of the person next to you, that's okay. As long as the two angles you have end up in the same location, you're okay. Okay, next we're going to talk about trig functions um, of any angle. And we're going to talk about a couple of things. P of x, y, which is a point on the terminal side of your angle in standard position, and r, which is the radius or the distance from the origin to that point. So I have a picture here of what's going on. So our point P is out here somewhere. You went 
um, over X and, and up Y to get to that point. And um, I'm not a fan of how this X is drawn up here. I would rather put it right here. I go over and up when I'm graphing points. The R is the distance from the origin to that point, so here. And so it's standing for the radius. Like if I made a circle out of that, it would be a radius. Um, but what we're going to be doing is focusing in on this triangle that I've made right here. This would be 90 degrees. So the sides are X, Y, and R. And then the angle theta is always close to the vertex, which would be at the origin. Um, and you can use this drawing to help you um, figure problems out. If you look at that drawing and you look at theta, your sine of theta would be y over r, your cosine would be x over r, your tangent would be y over x, and so on. I've listed all of those here. Some people just like to memorize these, and that is perfectly fine. If that is you, if you're a memorizer, then go for it. Other people like to just focus on the triangle because they already know how to look at a triangle and determine the six trig values. So whichever one you're more comfortable with, I'll show you how to do problems both um, in both situations. Um, but they really are the same if you draw it out. Um, before we go on, I do want to mention the um, points where we're going to be dealing with these. When we have a point in the first quadrant, everything that we get, all six trig functions should be positive. If we're in the second quadrant, we should end up with sine and cosecant being positive. In the third quadrant, tangent and cotangent are positive. And in the fourth quadrant, cosine and secant are positive. Okay, everything else is negative. If I'm saying that these two things are positive, then the other four trig functions should be negative. The only place where everything is positive is the first quadrant. And this is kind of a way to check and see if you have the right signs on your answers, and we may use this knowledge later for some other kinds of problems. Um, the way that this little picture is showing you to remember it is by the little saying, all students take courses. I've heard all students take calculus um, around here. It's our local thing, Appalachian State Teachers College, because that's what Appalachian State University was before it was a university. And so my professor is always... Um, taught us to remember it that way, but it's ASTC um, and it goes in the direction of positive angles or in the direction of your quadrants um, to remember it. Okay, so I have several um, of these point type problems for us um, in example three and um, I'm going to do them different ways. The first one, negative four, three, we're trying to find the six trig functions of theta. I'm going to use the triangle and so if I'm doing this, I'm going to draw my x and y axis, I'm going to plot the point, negative 4, negative 3. So it would be down here. I'm going to draw the line to that, and I'm going to draw a line to the x-axis. So this will be 90, this would be my theta. Now, think about how you got there. You went backwards 4 and down 3. So this side of the triangle would be negative 4, this side would be negative 3. You don't have your radius, but it's a right triangle, so you can use the Pythagorean theorem. So r squared should equal negative 3 squared plus negative 4 squared. And I highly recommend, if you're typing this in your calculator, to keep those in parentheses so that your signs end up correct. So r squared ends up to be 25 and r to be 5. It's a 3, 4, 5 kind of triangle. And then we're going to find the um, six trig functions from this triangle. So let me list those out. So for sine, from the perspective of the theta that we have, negative 3 is the opposite, negative 4 is the adjacent, 5 is the hypotenuse, so sine would be opposite over hypotenuse, or negative 3 fifths, which would make my cosecant negative 5 thirds. Cosine would be your adjacent over hypotenuse, so negative 4 fifths. My secant would be negative 5 fourths. Tangent would be opposite over adjacent, so negative 3 over negative 4, which would be positive 3 fourths because two negatives would make a positive. And then we'll flip that for the cotangent and get 4 thirds. Okay, so that was the method of just drawing out the triangle from the point. Um, if you'll notice, the values you got still match up with the x, y, and r 
um, so there's no problem. So if you're comfortable drawing the triangle, then draw the triangle. Um, for the people who like to memorize, then we'll do B with that kind of method. Um, you have X and Y, you need R. So R squared will be 1 squared plus negative 1 squared, it's just those two values. So in this case, R squared would be 2 and R would be the square root of 2. And so I'm going to write out my six trig functions for that. And if you um, look back up again at those um, equations from your notes before, that's what we're going to be focusing on here. So sine is <clears throat> your y value over your r. So my y value was negative 1, my r was the square root of 2. So cosecant would be the square root of 2 over negative 1 which would be the negative square root of 2. I can't leave the sign like this. I do have to rationalize. So I'm going to get negative square root of 2 over 2. Cosine would be your x over your r, so 1 over the square root of 2. Again, if I flip that, I get my secant, which in this case would just be the positive square root of 2, and I do need to rationalize my cosine. So I would get the square root of 2 over 2. And then finally, my tangent is my y over my x, so negative 1 over 1 would just be negative 1. Cotangent would be the opposite, but would still end up as negative 1 once I simplified. And so that's if you wanted to just memorize the way that the equations worked. So I'm going to let you pause and do C the way that you want to. So pause now. Okay, um, however you chose to do C, um, we're going to get um, those answers. I'm going to show you how to get those. So if you chose to graph, you would be graphing negative 1, 3. So your theta would be here. You went back 1. You went up 3. If you do the Pythagorean theorem correctly, you should get the R to be the square root of 10. And then whichever you use looking at the picture or looking at the formulas, then your sine would be 3 over the square root of 10. So your cosecant would be the square root of 10 over 3. Your cosine would be negative 1 over the square root of 10. So your secant would be the uh, negative square root of 10 over 1, which would be negative square root of 10. And then tangent would be 3 over negative 1, which is negative 3 cotangent would be negative one-third. I do need to come back to sine and cosine and rationalize those denominators and get three square roots of ten over ten and negative square root of ten over ten. So check those answers. And again, I don't care whether you draw the triangle or not um, as long as you can answer these problems correctly. Okay, our last example kind of builds on that same stuff, so um, we're going to finish up with it. So it says, given that tangent is negative two-thirds and theta is in the second quadrant, find the other values. This is another one. I like to draw the triangle. I mean, you could, you could realize that tangent's y over r, and this would be your y, or excuse me, y over x. This would be your y, this would be your x. You could find the r and so on, which is perfectly fine if that's what you want to do. Um, I just like to draw the triangle because I like to see what I'm doing. So if the tangent is negative two-thirds and you're in the second quadrant, let's start by drawing a line in the second quadrant and making our triangle. Um, you always connect down to the x-axis and your theta is always closest to the origin. And if the tangent being opposite and adjacent is negative two-thirds, you know this side's 2 and this side's 3. It's just a matter of where to put the negative. Because this was a simplified um, fraction. The 2 could have been negative to begin with or the 3. It, it, not both of them, but one of them was negative. We just have to look at the picture to see which one. And when you're graphing points and you go to the left, that's when you would get the negative. So the 3 is negative. The 2 is positive because you're going up. So just make sure you put the negative in the right place in a situation like that. Um, then we have to do Pythagorean Theorem to get r, so r squared will equal 2 squared plus negative 3 squared. 
and so that's 4 and 9, so we get 13, and then the square root of that is just the square root of 13. And then we are going to find the other five values. Now before I start looking at these four, I could actually do the cotangent just based on the tangent that they gave me, because remember that those two are partners, so I just have to flip it and get negative three halves. So cotangent, easiest one, I didn't even have to look over here. Sine opposite and hypotenuse, so that will be 2 over the square root of 13. Cosecant will be the square root of 13 over 2, but I do need to rationalize this first one. So that will be 2 square roots of 13 over 13. Cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, I have negative 3 over the square root of 13. I'm going to multiply again by the square root of 13 and get negative 3 square roots of 13 over 13. For my secant, I'm going to flip that original one and get negative square root of 13 over 3. And so that would find the other five values with kind of the same thought process as I was doing in example 3. Um, and that pretty much concludes this lesson.